Got yeah. it. Okay. 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 Ready. Okay. Um, all right. So let me start again. So this is an introduction to project-based language learning, but some of you already have a lot of experience with PBL. So maybe we hope you can, will be either confirming that you're doing it really well and or adding a few ideas for taking it up a notch, okay? As I mentioned a second ago, PBL is a type of experiential learning approach. And what this means is that um, it is based on learning by doing and using language in a real world way. And that's really good because that's exactly what heritage language learners like to do. So in this presentation, in addition to showing you how good PBL is about learning by doing, I'm gonna show you other great things about PBL. Then I'm gonna to move to giving you a step-by-step -step guide to creating projects that maximize engaging in language learning, some sample projects, and then how to's, how to instantiate PBL in a beginning class when your learners are at a very low level, and how to teach language with PBL. After all, we're here to teach language, right? Okay, next month's workshop is gonna be a deep dive into the first three elements of PBL. I'm gonna be presenting everything. After today, you will walk away with a complete view of PBL. But then next month's workshop, we're gonna do a deep dive into theme, driving question and product and really look at it in greater detail. So it's a nice follow-up to this one. And then in January, we'll do a deep dive into the process of how to structure projects, how to pace them, how to assess them, et cetera. So again, another deep dive. All right, so I think we can start out by saying, um, Sebel, Alejandro and I love PBL, right? Uh, it's fantastic, it works really well. And the reason why I love it is because it checks a lot of boxes. It's great for HL teaching and learning, it's great for language learning in general. And if you have mixed classes, it works really well because it kind of allows you to differentiate in a really meaningful way and pretty much and pretty easily too. It's great and it's great for learners of all ages. And if I should have added, well, it's great for remote learning. I'm not gonna get into it, but I should have added, it's also great for me because I end up learning something new every single time. I'm not doing the same thing that I do every single semester, which gets really boring. And frankly, after a while, I don't even wanna keep doing it. All right, so let's look at HL learning. Just there are three big ideas you wanna keep in mind when you're teaching heritage language learners. You want to expand functional proficiency, and that is what they can do with language. So generally speaking, you don't want to spend a lot of time looking at things like grammar, let's practice, practice, practice grammar. What you want to do is learn grammar in the process of using it for real world communication. That's not to say that you never want to focus on form, but generally you'll be much more successful. Your students will be much more engaged if you're looking to use to expand what they bring to the classroom, their communicative abilities. The second overarching goal that you wanna have is address all those motivations, goals, life experiences that bring them to the classroom. And the third thing you wanna be able to do when you're teaching HL learners, and this also happens in mixed classes, is you wanna start with the learner, not the curriculum. By that, I mean, you wanna differentiate because HL learners are so different from each other. If you're doing, if everybody's doing the same thing, you're only going to reach a certain portion of your class, not the entire class. So HL teaching is a lot about differentiation. All right. In terms of language journal, learning in general, this is a, a slide from the, the ACFL Partnership for 21st Century Skills. And I'm going to show you, on the left is what teachers did in the past. And on the right is what is recommended today in order to um, do, you know, enact these 21st, teach these 21st century skills. So I've already, talked about experiential learning, that's the first arrow that you see there that PBL does really well. 
I also talked about using language, not just talking about it and what's the rule, you know, in the book. It's using the language. It's also a learner-centered approach. Remember I said it's the ultimate differentiation uh, tool. And in and, and that way, it's learner-centered, but also because learners do a lot of the work, you're facilitating the learning. It uses thematic units, and today we're going to work with a couple of thematic units, right? And your books are organized in thematic units, right? The learner is doing with language. It's not just a teacher presenting, as you can see on the left-hand side. Using language to learn academic content. You're learning about the real world through language and uh, creating for an audience beyond the classroom. That connects to this idea of using real world language. And then the third thing I wanna point out is that it's really appropriate for learners of all ages and proficiency levels. So this is where I'm going to next when I show you um, some examples of PBL. This was presented in an actual small brief right at the beginning, well, maybe not right at the beginning, but a few months into the pandemic. And, okay. and what it was is um, a family where the mother was a Spanish speaker and the mom worked at home with the children to create a bilingual book that explored masks. Children were feeling apprehensive about masks. They, they had mixed emotions. They wanted to talk about their identity. How do you keep an identity when you cover it up behind masks? And they created, with the help of the mother, they created this bilingual book, which you can buy from on Amazon, actually. So this is a real project. Moving to high school. So that was middle school. Moving to high school, here's another example of a real project. Remember, I'm trying to show you that you can use it at every age, for every age and different levels of education. And I'm going to call this a dunk tank project. I'm going to come back to it. When you get the PowerPoint, if you link here, you can get a lot more details to this project. But this is a project that was done by a Japanese community school in Southern California. And the um, students, th there's a summer Japanese summer festival that the school celebrates every year. But the school, the, the students that year, these are high school students, wanted a dunk tank booth at their project. Right. And um, the teachers and the administrators at first are like, no, no way, because this is not a traditional thing. And we're trying to teach you about our culture. We're not going to allow this. But the students were so enthusiastic about it that they said, fine, make your case to us and then we'll decide. In order to make their case, the students had to really do some serious researching of the traditional features of a summer festival in Japan, and then also research what was being done, what innovations were being done. And this is, these are two really good points that Masako Douglas makes in the description of the project. She says, this was not a right wrong issue. Both sides had legitimate reasons, which however created a dilemma. And this situation gives a genuine learning opportunity to acquire content knowledge, critical thinking skills, and linguistic cultural knowledge and competencies. And notice the second piece she points out, the students who usually learn passively work seriously for the first time to have their proposal pass. So when you get this kind of engagement and enthusiasm on the part of students, you really want, you know, you have a winning uh, approach. Um, and, but we'll see how this also turned out very good for learning what the teachers wanted them to learn, which is the traditional things about the Japanese summer festival. Now, moving it up a level, the, this is a project that my students worked on. It was a class on Spanish for the professions. And I divided students into groups and they had to do a project. I'm being very vague in what I'm going to say related to the profession. And they had, so I had people who wanted to be teachers, people who wanted to be translators and interpreters, people who are going to be in the health profession, other people who were going to be in law enforcement, really a wide range of um, uh, professional fields were represented in the classroom. And I took them step by step 
And this is what we're going to see two months from now, where you, how you structure the project. But essentially, they had to find a problem in their field that they could solve. This is um, the uh, product that the teachers created. And the problem that they dealt with, the problem they were trying to address when they created this poster was that they talked to, this is part of the work that they did. They talked to Cynthia Leathers, who's a single subject advisor in our department. And they said, we wanted, we have this class and we have to create something for this class in the area of teacher preparation or becoming a teacher. What, how can we help you? How can we create something that will help you? And she said, well, you know, what actually happens is that students get started uh, this is a complicated process in California, and I think everywhere else. Students get started on the process, but they do it out of order, and then they have to backtrack, and there's an awful lot of frustration for them, and there's frustration for me. And I wish they came to me at the very beginning, but they don't always come to me at the very beginning, but I wish they had some way of knowing what the steps are. Well, for this project, which was a project that took quite a few weeks, they, my students who are the teachers, created this beautiful, huge poster, by the way. They went to Costco, and I think at the time they paid 25 bucks to have huge, huge poster. And they had to learn how to format it and how to, you know, how to work um, um, to make it look that beautiful. And then they gifted the um the poster to Cynthia Leathers. And for quite a while, this poster hung outside the office so that students could actually see it and, and, and figure out the steps that they needed to take in exactly what Cynthia wanted them to do. So that's a great example of um, a project at the college level. All right, so I hope I have convinced you that there's some great things about PBL. Now I wanna to move to a step-by-step -step guide because what happens with projects is they look really good if you step back. But then when you say, how do I do this? It becomes a little bit overwhelming, right? So a lot of it hinges on following the step-by-step -step guide that I'm going to give you. And as I said, today you're gonna to get all the steps all together. And in the next few months, we're going to actually break it down because in your experience, what you see today will probably be enough, but if you don't have that much experience or if you're dealing with a particularly difficult situation, you have a class that's highly mixed, um, you want to delve deeper into the elements of each of these steps. All right, so before I go into the step-by-step, -step, I want to give you a heads up on a little project, a little final activity we're all going to do, or if you want to do it, you can do it, and that's going to be creating a little project right? And the project is going to be based on something I found on Etsy, which I thought was great. It's a store of um, signs of, with words or, or sayings that Latino, obviously, I mean, I don't know who this Sarita is, but obviously she's a U.S. Latino and is, um, she has a lot of sayings here that come from her parents or her home situation. And last time I checked, it, she had sold some 600 of these posters, right? So you can see it's a great, it's a great idea for, for a store. And I want you to start to think about with the theme of sayings, a project as you hear start to build this because that's what we're going to do at the end of this presentation all right so let's get to project-based learning this is a place that i recommend that you go for more information it's the buck institute for education they have a million projects and um, a lot of information now it's is great but the problem is that there's very little specific to language and nothing that I could find specific to heritage language teaching. So whatever you find there, which will be very rich, you're gonna to have to adapt to the teaching of heritage languages. So this is a revised definition of PBL and I have highlighted all the key pieces. It's learner center and students work over a period of time. So it's not a task. Um, right, it says on a task, but it's different from the, the word the word task. The word task is used in second language teaching. 
the task here is extended. It's not something that happens in one class, but typically happens over weeks. And it's extended because it involves engaging with complex issues, solving problems, or uh, meeting particular real life challenges. And they to communicate their learning, to communicate that they've met these real life challenges, students develop some kind of product. And we're going to be looking at products um, in, in a few minutes. But the product can be timelines, blogs, brochures, reports, et cetera, whatever it is that addresses the problem that has been or the challenge that has been identified. So let's go and look at the Masako Douglas's project and judge it according to this definition. Remember, this is a dunk tank project. The students had wanted to convince the teachers and administrators that this summer they were going to do a, a traditional summer festival that included this non-traditional feature of a dunk tank, dunk tank booth. Hard to say. All right. So was it something, was it learner center or something that matters to a teacher? Clearly it's something that the students wanted to do. As a matter of fact, the teachers did not want the, them doing that. Was it extended work? For sure. The students had to research a lot of what's done in a traditional Japanese summer festival. And they also went online and found out about recent innovations in Japan so that they could make the case, hey, even the Japanese in Japan are putting new things into the summer festival, right? So that took a long time. They also had to learn how to do a presentation. The students were asked to do a presentation to the parents, the teachers, and the administration to convince them of having a dunk tank booth. So they really had to prepare a very polished and convincing presentation in Japanese. Did they um, gain key knowledge and success skills or isolated elements of language? In a language class, we typically focus on language. And frequently we forget that it's probably just as important to teach key knowledge and skills that help them, that support language learning, right? And in PBL, this comes from um, the Buck Institute. In PBL, you see that knowledge, key knowledge, understanding, and success skills <clears throat> is at this very center of what they call gold standard PBL, right? So you're teaching your learners how to learn and how to become self-sufficient, autonomous learners. All right, is it a real life challenge or a made up activity to practice language? No, it's a real life challenge, right? And, but also they end up practicing hearing and reading and, and using a lot of real language. And finally, the product, is it performance-based or knowledge-based? And I just, oh, I put this in the wrong place. Uh, let me, uh, sorry, I'll have to move back later on. Um, and, uh, so this is what I mean by, is it knowledge-based or is it performance-based? Knowledge is what your students come into the classroom with, but they can do spontaneously, unrehearsed language, what they do on their own. And that's what the placement test test and what the actual proficiency guidelines refer to. Performance is what they can do with you when you know you rehearse with them or you have carefully planned sequence, te teaching and learning sequence, right? PBL is about performance. So it performance typically is at a level higher, maybe a half, um, a sub-level at the actual proficiency guidelines. Could be two, depending on how much uh, time you take to do a project and how much guidance you give students. But the point is, you don't want your projects to be right at the level of what your students can do. You actually want them to be stretching, to be challenged and creating something that is at their level of performance that they need you to create. All right, so now you might be thinking, okay, very good, fine. I love PBL and you convinced me it's got a lot of nice things, but it's really for learners at the intermediate level and above. Now that's a pretty common 
perception that you can't do these higher order tasks, the harder things like put together a poster like that with lots of you know complicated, do this first and do this, that at low levels of proficiency. But is this actually true? Well, let me start out by just giving you a very, very quick overview of some aspects of the actual proficiency guidelines before I, we answer this question. So at the novice level, recall that learners put to work with words and phrases, it's formulaic language, it's other people's words, they can't create with language, right? At the intermediate level, they start to create with language to have their own words, but it's very loosely connected sentences. They still can't string together sentences into kind of a coherent paragraph. At the advanced level, they start to connect sentences and they can handle a complication. They become more spontaneous in their reaction, more like real world communication, right? And when you get to the superior level, we're talking about a series of paragraphs and pages, right? All right. So back to this question is, is PBL only for students who are intermediate or higher? So suppose you were asked the question in a job interview, the question that I'm going to show you in a second, how cognitively challenging is this question and how, and how linguistic challenging is it? So this is a pretty common question in job interviews. List four adjectives that describe you, pick two that are strengths and two that could be considered flaws. Cognitively, this is a really difficult thing to do, right? You wanna pick adjectives for strengths that align well with the job you, you hope to get. And in terms of flaws, you gotta be careful. You don't wanna come across as self-serving. You don't wanna do things, oh, I'm just too hardworking. I never know when to stop. That's not gonna work. But at the same time, you don't wanna be brutally honest and actually say what your weakness is. Oh, I'm gonna be a little lazy. Uh, I'm not that great with deadlines. No, no, right? So you've gotta be very strategic. So cognitively, it's really hard, but linguistically, it isn't, right? If you are applying to work in a nonprofit, you can describe a strength as compassionate, one word, right? So um, notice linguistically, this is fairly easy. Cognitively, it's very difficult. Remember also, this is about performance, right? PBL is about performance. So they, it's not like they have to pull the adjective out of their head. They're going to have to think about the adjectives and then they can look at look up words that will get them to answer the point. And I see Alejandro has raised his hand. Yes, there is a question and I don't know if you would like to answer the question now or later. Sure. Um, I have seen some districts adopting common core standards in place of actual world languages standards for their Spanish curriculum, instead of having them as a support. Do you know if we're moving in this direction in California? Hmm, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, Alejandro, do you know at all? I don't know. Um, it's not good news for ACTFL. I'll tell you that's the direction in which it's going. Um, I'm sorry. Let's, uh, I'm going to write it down and uh, perhaps and we'll we look it ask. up. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Does anybody here in the audience know the answer to that? Um, no, but I, I asked this question because I know there's, um, I think one or two districts that have translated the common course into Spanish Mm. and are using those instead of the act for the world language standards, which I thought, well, we have new standards in California this year, you know, since last year. And so why are they moving in this direction? So I don't know. That, that was just a question I had. I don't know. It's a good question. <laughs> and frankly, I don't know the answer to it. Thank you. Thank Sorry. You. No worries. <laughs> okay. So in order to do this, even at the lowest levels of proficiency, to come up with a real project, this is a real question that's asked in job interviews, you have to follow this plan. I said from, if you step back, PBL looks really good. And it looks like, oh, so spontaneous, that there's really very little that's spontaneous about PBL. Everything is carefully planned by you, the instructor. So the plan works like this. You start out by picking a theme, then you go on the, to the driving question, product, and in class, you go through the stages of working with information. 
you follow this plan, you'll get good projects out of your students. So let's go through this. Let's start with the theme. The theme is the central idea that defines your project. It's what the project is about. And it's usually described in a word or a short phrase, family, the environment, childhood. Why do you want to start with that theme? Because it makes it easier to find a problem and a product, right? If you're thinking family, boy, can you come up with problems in the family, right? So you can come up with issues like, you know, dividing up in my family, it's dividing up the chores. How does that work? Or walking the dog. I get stuck walking this huge creature, uh, which requires a lot of walking. So I, I, I wish we had a way to um, share the work. Okay. So if you start with a theme, it makes it easy to find a problem or to identify the driving question. And here's an example. Um, start with the theme of family traditions or practices and look for a real world problem that your students can address, right? So dating, for example, is a big deal because dating in Spanish speaking or in, in um, immigrant homes tend to be different from what it is in the US. So that's a problem when the, when the young ones start to date, how do you reconcile, right? The two different viewpoints. So quick activity. Think about your textbook and other pedagogical materials that you work with and write or two theme, one or two themes in the chat from that material that you're currently working with. So remember, themes is one word, family, traditions, whatever. I don't want to give it away. So put it in the chat and let's see what uh, we come up with. Maybe, um, Sybil, if you can start reading them as they're coming up. Uh, COVID, Latino identity, La Familia, Tradiciones, Family, Deportes, Identidad, Natural Disasters. <laughs> That goes with identity, I think. Yeah. Uh, belleza y estética, pruebas, tourism, imagination, la imaginación, leyendas, legends. Okay. Uh, environment, diversity, environment. Right. Culture. Exactly. Right. So yeah, you can see food is also typically something that you find in your in your textbooks, right? Sometimes there's a chapter about the future. What do you want to do in the future, right? So why consult the book for theme ideas if you're planning to create a project? Well, because, you know, a, a typical problem that comes up is teachers go, I love PBL, but my book is asking me to do one thing and PBL is going, pulling me in another direction. But if you can pull the theme, the theme from the book, what you do is you end up creating a situation where you can be doing both at the same time. Sybil, did you see that? That's pretty clever. Anyways, uh, <laughs> so using textbook themes makes for easier integration of PBL in the syllabus. Now, many of you listed these general themes. Hobbies are another ones that usually show up in um, units, in, in, in books, right? Um, hobbies are also rather popular. So these are kind of general themes that work in your L2 class, as well as in your HL class, right? And in mixed classes, they work well too. Here are some HL specific themes. I'm not saying you have to do these, but these are things that we know from the research that HL learners are really interested in. Identity, uh, Sybil read to us about several of them. We know that HL learners want to find out who they are relative to, you know, are they from the US? Are they, are they from their heritage culture? Where does language fit in in who they are? Cultural compar comparisons like the, the Japanese kids, right? They wanted to create something different, right? Connecting with HL speakers in the US, in the US or abroad. We know that they want to connect and create communities for pe with people who speak the, their HL. The problems of navigating to cultures, the dating, you know, we did a unit once in, in, with my HL learners with dating, how different datings are. And it was an interesting unit because it developed into a unit about lies they tell their parents about dating. 
So it turned out to be a lot of fun. Navigating two languages is usually leads them to talk about linguistic insecurities that they have. So notice that the poster I showed you, life, career, and goals, is something that could have come out of um, a general theme from a textbook. The COVID book was about current events. That's also typically a chapter in books, right? And then the dunk tank project is really a very good HL specific theme, although it doesn't have to be only for HL learners, but it's very good because it involves these comparisons and navigating two cultures and creating a new culture in the United States, which is a blend of the students two cultures. So now that we've kind of seen how it works, let's quickly recreate a project with a little bit of an adaptation. So heads up, as we're doing this, we're preparing at the end to, we're going to create a project. So as I'm, we're going through the idea of theme, driving question, product, and stages, you're thinking ahead as we're recreating this project together. Well, okay, I'm going to have to apply this when we get to the end, right? All right, so the theme is going to be career goals. Okay, so it's the same. We're going to recreate sort of the project I showed you with the big poster, which is what my students created. All right, the driving question is going to be more or less the same as what my students ask themselves. Remember, the driving question or problem is the issue that's being addressed. It's what you're gonna solve, right? And the driving question usually comes from the real world, the school setting or the home environment. So the driving question doesn't have to be something like world peace, right? It can be something in the school <laughs> environment that needs to be solved, right? So if you go to the Buck Institute of Learning, you see that, a driving question might be how to improve the school cafeteria menu. Not that the students are actually going to improve it, but they're not going to be the ones to do it, but they can convince maybe the administration if they work hard enough how to improve on that, right? So the driving question or problem relates closely to the issue of authenticity which the Buck Institute of Education defines as the project as real world context, uses real world processes, tools, and quality standards, makes a real impact, and or is connected to students' own concerns, interests, and identities. And at this point, I'm going to have to go back to that slide where I said, oh, I put it in the wrong place. I'm going to have to go back to that slide and show you uh, why it's important to bring this up. Okay, so this is a study that was done by Kim Helmer. She visited, she spent a long time observing a high school in Los Angeles, a heritage language class in this high school. And she was having a hard time figuring out why in this class, which was it's not that the teacher was bad, not at all. The teacher had great activities and was very engaged with the students, but the students were not uh, engaging with the material. As a matter of fact, they were rebelling against what the teacher was trying to learn, to teach him. And Kim was having a hard time figuring why this was happening until she started to talk to a student and the student said, it's just a story to learn Spanish. It's not real. And at that point, she came to the conclusion that this might serve as an explanation why students did not engage in the discussion because students' exposure to and use of Spanish had been highly contextualized and communicative, designing curricula that emulate naturalistic, authentic content should have been a goal of class. So not designing activities that really just provide an opportunity to practice a grammar point, but designing curricula that really engage them in the way they're engaged in using language and that is addresses topics that they're really interested in. I'm going to move forward now to where I was, if I can remember where I was. I can probably locate it. Okay, so we were a driving question. Here we go. 
And we said that authenticity is really important. So let's play a game. Um, you ask your students to do a class presentation on an important tradition in the heritage language, so, so culture, sorry. So if you're teaching Spanish speakers, maybe it's um, the Three Kings, Feast of the Magi, Los Tres Reyes Magos. So if you're teaching Japanese speakers, it's a tea, um, the tea celebration. No, it's not the tea celebration. Um, sorry, I can't access the word right now. So traditionally, if you ask your students to do a class presentation, that's not a project. Why is it not a project? Well, because for one, what is the problem that you're really trying to solve in the real world, right? Who's your audience? Is that is that something, are you trying to solve a problem for them? That is, doing a class presentation is an example of doing projects, but not an example of doing project Base learning. So the kind of thing that we, we assign for the end of a semester, where our students, where our students just stand up in front of the classroom and present something is doing projects. With PBL, we want to really look at real world language use. So can we improve on this? Well, we already saw an example of this, right? The dunk tank project. Notice that this was a twist on the established way of doing the Japanese summer festival. Sorry, the tea ceremony, I just remember. And in creating this twist and convincing school administrators, parents, and teachers to allow them to do the twist, the students learned a lot about how the established traditional way of celebrating the summer festival is done in Japan. But What's really nice is that they created their own new tradition and one that blends both of the worlds, right? The American world with the dunk tank project, they, they innovated in that way. And also the Japanese um, more traditional way of doing things. So this is an example of notice the difference between ask them to get in front of the classroom and deliver a presentation on the Japanese summer festival. Kind of boring, right? On the other hand, if you have them do this, they're learning about the Japanese summer festival, but they're learning with the point of view that they want to do something extra. So they're you, you are engaging them in something that they want to do and they're learning with a purpose, right? All right, so now let's talk about this. Typically, and talk about, this is a typical unit in a, in a chapter, right? Learning about a dish from the heritage culture or, um, you know, traditional eating traditions. That's kind of typical when you do a reading. Can you think of any way to adapt it a little bit? Again, I'm going back to this idea that you want to work with what's there. Because if you want to work with that, what's there, you're kind of furthering the use of the textbook, which makes life easier for you. And you're not trying to do two parallel things at the same time. So taking this idea from the dunk tank project, right? Can you do something? Can you add a little something to a traditional activity of reading about a dish? Or even sometimes, see, like my children would come home with a project to cook something and to do a video recipe. Okay, that's good. It's sort of like a presentation, right? Now, can you do a little, can you think of something to turn it into, to make it more real and to turn it into something that students can engage with more fully? Anybody? I know I'm putting you on the spot. This is you know, quick thinking. Has anybody done a, a project with food? Um, somebody wrote, how about looking at ingredients and whether they are healthy or not? That's a good one. Right. That's a very good one. Exactly. Um, here's another one. How about putting together our class recipe book? Right. And then maybe selling it at a school fair or something like that. Right. Okay. And very good. Thank you for the person who volunteered that. Um, yeah, now, Maria, there's one other yeah, one that yeah. uh, was really good. And it said, I had the students create their own diet. Ah, now, will they follow it? That's a different issue. But that's a very good one, too. 
that's very good too. Yeah, and they can keep a journal of what they're eating and see how close it's coming to that diet that they want to create. Excellent. Right. So notice that's real. And a lot of people are interested in talking about food, whether they're eating right or not eating right, whatever. All right. Now, here's the last one is the biggest challenge. <laughs> And I try to make it as challenging as possible. That is to make it as difficult for you as possible to come up with a real world challenge. Suppose you've taught the enlightenment and um, the class presentation again, oh my God, a class presentation and the main ideas of the enlightenment. So a student gets something and says the class does a class presentation and everybody's like shoe shopping if they have their computer open or they're texting their friends, right? Because who wants to listen to that? Here's, an, here's a little twist. Before I tell you what my idea is, does anybody have any ideas as to what to do? <laughs> this is a hard one. So I'm putting you on the spot. You might not have anything that comes to mind immediately. Okay, so let me tell you, maybe that was too quick. Anything coming in through the chat? We're still talking about food. <laughs> oh, any more ideas on the food? Yes, there were some great ones. There was uh, how to make Japanese food using ingredients that we can buy here. A Spanish Iron Chef project-based learning project. Uh, oh, I love it too. Yeah. Uh, let me see. Um, quiz about our holidays and send it for children in Japan. Excellent. These are all great ideas, right? And they, they don't just involve repeating what has been done already. They, they engage students in creating something new, you know, putting their personality into it. Right. Now to the enlightenment, I, I purposely picked this because you can see in a literature class, if you teach AP, something like this, maybe it wouldn't be the enlightenment, but um, some period of history or literature, right? So this is a tough one, but here's one thing you can do. Hey, what are some, idea some ideas from the enlightenment that you want to incorporate into your life or that you feel society would benefit from remembering nowadays from bringing back that we may have forgotten, right? Obviously this rationality, this exploration, more scientific exploration of things. So maybe taking from there and saying, hey, I like this and this is a, a weakness of mine. And, and so I'm gonna draw on that to get back closer to the ideal person I wanna be right? Or it could be some things I don't like. Related to this, I frequently have students do create two lists. One, and on one side, they, what they like about the, um, the United States. On the other side, what they like about the country of origin. And then they turn the page and they create their own world which merges, brings together, they take from the American culture, things that they like, and they take from their age culture, what they like, and they create a whole new world. So it's an activity they really love. Again, this idea of this trick of having them create something that blends things from both worlds. Back to our project now. So we said the driving question, I'm gonna give it to you because we're reconstructing the project that I showed you that my students did, but we're reconstructing it at a lower level, just to show you how you can do this at many different levels of proficiency. So what does it take to become a doctor, lawyer, engineer, fireman, astronaut, et cetera? You can see this would be a project that middle, skilled, skid, uh, middle school kids would love. Even kindergartners would love this, right? So that's going to be a driving question. The driving question, engages them in something that they want to solve, in something that is a real gap, right? Of course, little kids all want to know, how do, how do they become an engineer? How do they become a fireman? How do they become an astronaut? And big kids too, of course, because in college, they're preparing for careers, right? So this is an appropriate question at almost every level, right? So with this as your driving question, mm, one second. Oh, okay. So we get now to the product. Oh, before I, 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 we get to the product, you might ask yourself, is this an authentic question? And I just answered it. 
it is authentic because it's something that in students are that in our students at every age are engaged engage in finding out. With the little kids, it's like a dream, oh, I wanna be an astronaut. But it's an authentic question for them, how do you become an astronaut? For college students is, I, am, I wanna be a doctor and I wanna use Spanish in my career. So how do I do that? How do I train to become a doctor? And what do I need to know in order to serve the Spanish speaking community, local Spanish speaking community? Be that as it may, it's pretty good that we're creating a poster, but at the end, we're gonna do even better, okay? So you always wanna be reaching for that authenticity. So this is pretty good in the sense that it addresses something that students are interested in, but it's not as good as it could be. We'll get to that very close to the end, okay? So now let's move to product. The product is how students solve the real world problem. So remember the dunk tank project, the presentation that students gave before the administrators, the teachers and the parents, that was the product they created to argue for the dunk tank booth, right? And for you, it's also how students communicate their learning, what you use to give them a grade, right? So that's the product. There are many different, pro the world is full of products, right? A survey uh, and presenting the results of a survey can be a product. Creating a menu for um, the idea of somebody um, talked about, have them create a diet, you can create a menu. Greeting cards if you're hosting an event, um, marketing campaigns, a school event, a poster can be a product, a pamphlet, um, an interview, a taped interview of somebody, a public service announcement. The world is full of products. Um, I'm sitting here right next to my bed and I'm looking at this cream that I put on my hands every single night before bed. Well, you know, translating this into your uh, language is, uh, this is a product, right? So the world is full of products. But you have to ask yourself, would I display how to become an engineer on a product like this? No, obviously you want to align the product with the driving question that you're going to, that you're trying to answer. So in this case, again, we're reconstructing the project that my students created. The product is going to be a poster. But recall that my student's poster was quite elaborate. These are college students, right? And they had a whole semester to work on this poster. We're gonna simplify things a little bit to show you again that if you think PBL is too advanced for your students, you'll see, I think you'll see you're wrong, okay? So I hope to pleasantly surprise you. If you look at products, if you go online and you start looking at uh, posters, you'll find that they come at all levels of proficiency. Same thing goes for just about any product you can look, you can think of, right? Book jackets, here's, um, Here's a book jacket that's fairly simple. Um, this one's even simpler, right? Madame Bovary. I'm going back and reading the books I read in high school because I figured they were wasted on me when I was in high school. They're probably much more interesting. I know they're much more interesting to me right now. All right, so let's look at projects, uh, at posters. This is a poster that answers the question, well, what can you, what are the careers in math? Right. So notice how simple the language is. If you like math, consider these careers. And then they just put careers. By the way, if you think about your book, uh, the book that you use, it's usually a unit on careers. And it's kind of dull how they go about it. Notice how much more interesting it is to take this approach. If you like math, these are careers you could consider. If you like talking to people, these are careers that you might consider. If you like science, these are careers you might consider. If you like adventure, these are careers you might consider. Wow, notice you're learning still many, but actually more of the same career names, profession names that we learn typically in a language book, but you're really doing it in a much more differentiated way where students who are interested in math can do it this way in a way that's meaningful to them. So it's more differentiated and more meaningful because you're connecting it to what you like in the real world. 
Notice though, the vocabulary, as I said, is very simple. In terms of the actful level, it's just words and phrases you're not really creating, right? So is this something that beginning students can do? Absolutely. Again, the idea is not, can they just pull it out of their head on their own? No, the idea is this is performance. So can you guide them to create this and to learn the vocabulary? I think so. Here's another poster that also talks about careers. And here we start to get a few phrases, quick response to crisis, ability to make snap decisions. So it starts to become a little bit more complicated, but notice there's also a lot of, dis a lot of um, adjectives, empathetic, disciplined, compassionate, motivated, right? Again, it's a pretty, pretty low level of language, but this is a real poster from the real world, by the way. This is not a simplified poster for language learning, right? This is not an activity to practice a grammar point, as we saw in that Helmer study that where the students rebelled. This is a real poster from the real world, right? But again, this is now a level higher than that first one we saw because you start to get phrases. Now, look at this one, how to find the right career for me. So notice here we have some commands. Ask yourself, I'm, I'm here, I'm looking at the first little square. Ask yourself, and then we have some questions. What are my interests? Which subjects do I like, et cetera? So notice, get inspired by people, more commands. Explore, choose, get practical. So there are questions and commands. Now that's a higher level, right? And it's got, it's got two grammar points that are commonly taught at be, in the beginning, first term of instruction, right, at a very low level, but also are commonly taught through the whole sequence of language learning, right? In college, at the college level, this is like the four semesters, and maybe a little bit beyond that. Um, so these are important grammar points. And the actual level now, we see we're now at the intermediate, and depending how you do it, might be even higher that than intermediate. So notice I've taken you from a poster that was really at the lowest level, true novice, to novice, mid to high, and now we're intermediate. This is intermediate high because now you're starting, you're getting phrases that are kind of connected in categories. And here's one that's at the superior level. Don't even try to read it. This is put, uh, this is the uh, US something or other, and it's incredibly complicated language. I can't think of a single reason why you want your students to create something like this. But my point is that posters come at many different language levels and with many different formats. This is a terrible format because who could ever read that, right? So that's the point. Products, many products don't have a fixed proficiency level or grammar or language point. So you, you find the product that you think lends itself to solving the problem, this driving question that you have identified. And then you fine tune that product. What is my poster going to look like, right? So this is where teacher presence um, matters a lot. So you know your student's proficiency level. Proficiency remembers what they come into the classroom with. And then you're going to pick the product. You're the conductor of this orchestra. You're going to pick the product that stretches them just the right amount, right? If, it's, if the product is at their level of proficiency, they're not learning. If the product is way above their level of proficiency, they're not learning either. They're just going to get frustrated. So you want to take into consideration how much time you have, how difficult the product and the question is, and how much assistance you can give them before you select the product, right? And that brings me to the stages of working with information. Remember, the next um, workshop is going to be about this, these three. We're going to really delve more deeply into these three. This is this will be the January workshop in case you're interested, right? So the three stages of working with information. The first one is gathering or collecting information. Let's see what this looks like. This is where you ask yourself, okay, what language and models of the product will help students succeed, will help students get 
uh, create the product at a high level. And I always like to say this, they need to look at models. A number of years ago, ACFO asked me to write a pamphlet uh, for this Lead with Languages initiative that they had. And I created a pamphlet that was I thought was good for content about heritage languages. But then when I turned it in, they returned it right back. And they said, the content is great. The format is all off. Go read pamphlets and figure out the language of pamphlets, which is really short phrases, not even full sentences. Typically, you don't even get full paragraphs. So they need to see models to figure out how a pamphlet is done, the language of pamphlets. And by the way, this is a problem with many classes that ask students to write an essay. If they haven't read many essays, how the heck are they going to write an essay? They read many, they need to read many models of an essay in the target language before they, and they need to analyze it before they can produce um, an essay. So now this is the part where you say, well, if I want my students to produce this kind of product, I'm going to have to make sure that they learn adjectives. Maybe that's a point that they're studying right now in your unit, right? So whereas if I want them to produce this kind of a poster, you're going to want to emphasize the WH words, writing questions and commands, right? So notice your grammar point is going to vary. Notice here, for those of you who speak Spanish, this command is being done using the infinitive, right? That's typically how formal commands are done in writing in Spanish and these kinds of abbreviated language, right? But the point is that you want to make sure that the language used is appropriate. One thing you don't want your students doing is doing something like you need to obtain um, a, a bachelor's degree in Spanish because a poster a formal kind of thing doesn't ever address the reader directly, doesn't ever address the audience directly. So this is one of the things I work with with my students. How often do you get your students writing an essay and they have this you, 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 you. I say, no, no, depersonalize it. So this is kind of what they're learning it's not just language, but the format of academic language. So the point is that you need to think about all those language and genre specific conventions and you want to teach them, right? But better than teaching them is guide your students to discover them by studying authentic materials. So that brings us to the first step gathering or collecting authentic input. Remember my situation with the pamphlet. It didn't work because I didn't study pamphlets ahead of time, right? So what, I'm sorry, I, I jumped ahead. Um, so a good strategy for novice learners is to have them use other people's words, right? So let me show you what I mean. There are two columns of verbs here. The first one has verbs that in, in, involve using other people's words, other people's language, right? You can collect other people's language, organize other people's language, find it, display it, select. The second column involve creating with language. Remember, we said at the novice level or at the lower levels, this is what students can do. Once they enter the intermediate level, this is what they can do. So you can use this model of, am I gonna have them use other people's language or are they going to create their own language to think about the, what you want to go on the product, be it a poster, a pamphlet, a book jacket, whatever it is that you're going to create. And of course, if the product is very sophisticated, even if they are at the intermediate level, you might want them to use other people's words and rearrange them a little bit. Okay, so you might be asking yourself, okay, so I'm gonna use other people's words? How does this support acquisition? The answer is that in order to learn a language, you need to have input to the language, right? And that input needs to be, you need to notice it, right? So you have to be focusing on this input. Right, And that's what happens when you're creating a product 
even if you're using other people's words, right? So at the gathering um, uh, phase, they're collecting authentic input. They might be collecting authentic um, posters to learn what, what a poster looks like, what kind of verb forms are used in a, po a poster, what kind of words are used in a, pro in a, in a poster. Right? So they're collecting authentic materials. But it's not just a poster. You want them to collect posters. You don't want them to make the mistake I made with the pamphlet, good language, bad format. You want them also to collect content information. So something like this, if they can find pamphlets, if they can find articles, then they're looking through this material. Why? Because this is how they're going to learn the language, right? They're not reading a pamphlet, so they're not going to uh, copy the format, but they're going to learn the language that they're going to have to use, right? So now you have your poster and you want to decide what kind of poster you want to create. And remember, a poster is a very flexible thing. You can have a lot of language or it can be very simple. They're all authentic, right? So once you decide what kind of poster you wanna create, do you want something like what my students created, which had a lot of language, or do you want something very simple, like the one with adjectives or simple nouns? Then you go back to the information that you gathered, right, these pamphlets, and you go, well, in order to create the kind of poster I want, what do I need to look for in these pamphlets? What words am I going to pull out? I'm collecting other people's words. I may adapt them a little bit, but what words am I going to pull out from here to create the exact type of poster that I want. So if you're, if you, what you want is adjectives, you're going to look through these pamphlets and look for adjectives. Notice in this poster, we also have a few phrases, right? So you're going to go to this pamphlet and look for phrases, right? Same thing. If you're going to create this kind of poster, well, you, there may not be questions in the, in that pamphlet, but you might have enough language there to form questions out of the statements that you're seeing in these pamphlets or to form commands, right? The point is that you are working with authentic materials. One type of authentic materials is posters so that they understand the format of posters in the target language. And another type of authentic materials or models is actual stuff with content, with the language used in an authentic way right so again you look through these pamphlets or whatever it else it is that you know youtube videos whatever else you're working with and you're pulling out the language and the format of the language that will enable you to create the type of poster that you want to create now you're pulling out all this language but you're not just plastering it on your poster your, your students are making editorial decisions, right? So they're collecting a lot of stuff. And I have my students collect a lot more than they'll ever use because as they're collecting, they're going, oh, this is good. I want to do it like this. And that was not so good. That's not a good poster. They're starting to figure out to make editorial decisions and trying to figure out what makes a good poster or what makes a good pamphlet or what makes a good book jacket or a good a commercial or public service announcement. Remember, that goes back to these knowledge and skills that's at the center of PBL. And so they're selecting and in some cases reducing, expanding. They're doing a, a lot of editorial thing. Again, as I said, they're doing what is at the very center of gold standard PBL. They're going beyond language and learning these really important academic skills, which will help them in school beyond the Spanish class or the Japanese or the Russian class, but and um, will also make them self-sufficient learners. Right. So you've got gathering where you put together, you gather models, models and models, and you're putting them someplace. I'll, I'll tell you in a second. You're processing. Once you've got all of these, you start looking. Oh, look, that's a good word to use. Oh, look, that's a good verb. Oh, I can make a sentence out of that statement. I can make a, a question out of that statement if you're going to put it in question answer format. Now this brings us to the presenting stage. And the interesting thing or the key thing about PBL is that you're not just presenting one big thing at the end. 
you are constantly presenting to the instructor and students presenting to each other little bits of the project as they're working on it. So let me show you how I do this in my own teaching. I use exit cards every single time we meet, and especially when we're working on projects. And every day I give them an assignment and students turn in a piece of, um, they turn in a piece of the work on the project, uh, of the final project or product in my class in the form of an exit card. So for example, suppose we're at the information gathering stage, I will have asked them as homework to print out samples, let's say we're working with posters, to come into class and come with three sample um, posters that they found online. Now they're working in groups and I, it might be a group of four or five. And I might say to them, hey, in your exit card, you're gonna turn in for your exit card, you're gonna turn in the three best ones and you're gonna write down why you thought there were three best ones from the point of view of what you wanna create. That's an exit card at the information gathering stage. Moving to the information processing stage, I might say to them, hey, go to the products. And remember, they're in a group of five and everybody found three or four or five posters. Now they've got a whole bunch of posters they're looking at. Typically, I have them keep them in an online um, in an online document, um, like a Google doc, right? So I might say, pull out key verbs. And I have to remind them when I say pull out key language, they typically all pull out nouns, but I have to say to them, hey, you got to pull out key verbs. If you're working on adjectives, you're going to have to pull out key adjectives. adjectives. If you're working on um, phrases, you're going to have to pull out key phrases. And so their exit card that day involves making a list of keywords that they're known will help them create that um, product, that poster they're going to create. And when we move to the information presenting stage, same thing. We're pulling out all those exit cards when they've collected language and they've collected samples of the best products. And they're looking at it now. And I might say, hey, focus on the main I don't know what it's called in a poster, but the main piece of the poster, the main, the biggest um, um, font in the poster that calls attention to it. And that's what they might work on that day and turn in in the form of an exit card at the end of the class. Of course, you're going to have to debate what language they're going to use. Why select that as the main header in a poster, right? And it's going to have to adhere to the conventions of the language. If the idea is to use um, infinitives, that's what they're going to have to use. Whatever it is that they observe is done in the target language, right? Each time they turn in an exit card and they're working on a little piece of the project, I return it with a comment if they did it wrong. Or if they did it right, I bring it up before the class and say, hey, this group had a really cool idea. They found this great website with lots of good information, right? Um, no matter what, they get a grade. And because every single time they're coming to class, they're turning something in, that's my way of making sure that they're engaged in the project, that they're not just sitting there talking about what they did the night before, the movie they, they're gonna watch this weekend. They're really engaging in the project. They're really completing this little piece. And I tell them, hey, look, it behooves you, not just the grade, it behooves you to do this little piece because at the end of the term, you'll have, you pull all the pieces together with my comments and I have been correcting or giving you feedback on each of these little pieces, you're gonna put it all together and you're gonna create this final product that's going to be very high quality because you've been putting little pieces together, getting feedback from me. And then some more little pieces together and feedback from me. That's an ideal language learning situation for your students. And by the way, it's an ideal situation for you because you're not looking at really bad products. How often do you get a, something a student produces that's really bad and you go, oh my God, where do I start correcting this thing? What a headache. That doesn't happen with PBL because you're correcting it a little bit at, the time, at a time when the problems come up. Okay, great 
but we're almost done here and I'm going to put you how much time. Oh, perfect. So remember we said, well, poster, a poster, oh, what real world problem are you solving? And um, remember I said, well, it's something that interests students. So within their world, it's, um, it's authentic. It's a problem to solve. But is there a way that we can make it more authentic so that it doesn't feel like that little class presentation that we like to do, right? Remember that schools like to have fairs. Remember the dunk tank project? It was in the context of the Japanese summer festival. Stu schools sometimes have book fairs, any number, you know, back to school kind of events. And so you could have students producing their, um, their posters in different careers, you can group them by career interest, and then displaying these posters at a school job fair, right? So that kind of um, frames it in a very real activity that schools have, and it takes it outside of the classroom. Now it becomes something that benefits other students in the school. So by way of summary, and remember, I'm still going to put you to work in the last 10 minutes to create something. So by way of a summary, think of selecting the theme and the driving question to maximize engagement and coordinate with your syllabus. So think about when you think about theme, go through your book. If you press for time and if you think, oh, you know, then my school really wants me to stick to the book. Well, go through the book and find a theme that you can create a project for, right? And also think in terms when you select themes, what is it that interests my students? We talked about HL themes, but they can also be sports. They can also be current events, whatever it is that your students seem to be interested in. The product, when you think about what product am I going to have my students produce? Remember, you're orchestrating this whole thing, right? When you think about products, one second, Sybil, and I'll get to you. Um, think about, is this a proper product for, select, for solving the problem, right, that you have? If what you wanna do is think about careers, um, obviously you're not going, this is not a proper, a label for a, a product it, like this is not a proper, it doesn't address the problem that you're, you're trying to come up with, right? So that's where you think, can it solve the problem? And then within that, you're going to choose, let's say, the right kind of pro, um, poster or the right kind of label or pamphlet or whatever it is that you're going to do. Yes, Sybil, sorry. Yes, well, this might be something you'll be addressing later, but it's about rubrics. Uh -huh. so, uh, Jacinto says he loves the planning stage, but what's difficult is uh, creating the rubrics. And That's Ivani says, uh, does PBL call for both product rubrics and performance rubrics and performance out of the classroom. So just to get a better idea of where Those we're going. Excellent, excellent questions. And this is something we'll get into greater detail in January. But one of the great things about PBL is that at that information gathering and um, the information collecting and analyzing stage, you are you co-create the rubric. Remember that exit card I told you that I might give him, I might say, hey, your group, together you have 15 posters, pick out three that are really good and tell me why you think they're good. Or I might say, pick two that are really good, tell me why you think they're really good and pick the worst one and tell me why you think it's the worst one. Then students are thinking about, well, what, um, what does a good poster look like? Right. Then the next day we come to class. This is one of the many activities that we do. And again, this I'm going to deal with in more detail in January. We co-construct the rubric. Oh, a bad, a bad poster is just so full of words you can't even read it. Right. Uh, so they start to we, we, we put together a rubric that. Uh, but where they're not just pulling it out of their head, they're actually looking at models and playing at paying attention to the format and the language of good quality models. And we are co-constructing rubrics. I'm not giving them the rubrics. They are pulling out the essence, the elements of a good product 
looking at authentic uh, models, right? Now, I hope I answered the question. Uh, and, and there was another question about performance. Can you repeat that one, Simil? Uh, yeah, it's product rubric and performance rubric. And is the performance out of the classroom? No, it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be out of the classroom. Frequently in pure PBL, you want to take it out of the classroom, right? So the, that's why I said these posters about what does it take to become an astronaut, a teacher, whatever. Yeah, you can display them in the classroom and that's great. But if you can also integrate them into a school fair so that it helps other students. And also when you take it out of the classroom and you expose it to a wider audience, the level of quality has to really go up. No Mickey Mouse stuff because they're embarrassed. They don't want to be embarrassed in front of the whole school. So that's why I say think about, you know, make it a present. If it's a present you're going to give parents or if you're going to give to the school, administ a school administrator or whatever, then when you take it out of the classroom, generally the quality goes up. They're not just performing for each other. They're performing for a real world um, audience. And performance, they come, here comes the word performance. Performance is what they're doing as they're creating the product. Performance is doing with language. So the performance is what you're going to grade, right? And there are two ways of grading it. I grade every little exit card that comes in. Every single day we meet, remember, I give them an exit card. And this is low stakes uh, assessment. If they're on task, they may make mistakes, right? Doesn't matter. If they're on task and they, they, they did a good faith attempt, I, I can see that they try, they get a full grade, but they get my comments, hey, fix this. And maybe the next day I'll come into class and I'll work with the students that kept making the same mistakes. And I say, careful with this, don't repeat this mistake. And actually when they turn in the final product, they better not have made that mistake because I've already corrected it, corrected it and told them not to make that mistake. Right? So there's many iterations where they're going through it and they're fixing, making mistakes, fixing, making mistakes, fixing. Now, when they get to the end, that summative assessment. And at that point, the stakes are high. Why? Because they've had a lot of feedback along the way. So at that point, they've had a lot of opportunities to correct. And if they haven't corrected, what it tells you is they're careless, right? So two levels of grading, formative, low stakes, where they're constantly getting feedback. And you give them the point. I give them two points if they're on task, two out of two. Um, and then the format at the end, the ass final assessment very high stakes, and I'm very strict, but that's because they've had all this feedback along the way from me. And finally, when you're talking about these stages of working with information, you structure the, pro the process so that students get the language. Think of terms of what language are they going to have to do get in order to produce a good quality product at the end, and what models of authentic products of the type that you want them you want them to create are you going to want them? Uh, are they going to have to look at in order to create a high quality? model. One thing I want to mention, actually, it's not in this um, thing, in this PowerPoint, but it just occurred to me, you don't want students recreating the wheel. You don't want them, you know, there's already a pamphlet that does what's been done, what you, what's out there, and it's um, accessible, widely accessible. You don't want your students to recreate that. You want them to create something, maybe use that and do something else with it, change the format. If it's a pamphlet, turn it into a poster. If it's a pamphlet, turn it into, um, I don't know what else you can, um, you know, you can turn it into, but create a product that doesn't exist. If a product already exists, what, what, what's the, you know, what's the fun? What's the point of recreating it, right? Now, five minutes, do we have time? Oh yeah, okay. Let's see how this works. I don't know how this works with the group this size. Let's give it a try. All right, so remember, uh, oh yeah, Sybil. Did, did you just raise your hand? I did. And no. um, Karina would like to know more about your dating unit and what the driving question was. So I don't know if you want to talk about that now or uh, send information to her or put it in the chat or sure, something. Sure, I'll talk about it. So as I said, it was you, the dating as in, you know, the one I mentioned earlier, it, that was a great 
unit uh, because it really turned out to be a unit, as I said, about lying to parents, right? So first thing they did was a um, brainstorm in class about the difference in dating, right? And there were some very funny things like, you know, a lot, some Latino parents are back in the early 20th century. I mean, I, I'm serious. Some of my the parents of my students are like the, the chaperones. Can you imagine having a chaperone in modern society? So they brainstormed. They had a lot of fun with this. And then they interviewed parents. And they got insights into why the parents view things the way they view them. So they became, they became a little bit more respectful of parents' point of view. And they also um, explore the experiences with dating, their parents' experiences with dating when they were young, right? So now they start to make cultural comparisons, right? They also thought about themselves. And that's why that was the fun part when they said, oh, I want to lie to my parents about this. Well, that's nothing. I did that other thing. You know, I told a friend to call my parents and say that I was going to be at her house um, for sleepover. And it wasn't like that at all. Um, I actually had a very funny experience here in my own house where um, my son, as a senior, had Oh man, a sleepover, a co-ed sleepover. I, I don't know how it ended up being that way, but we were chaperoning anyways. But in the middle of the night, one of the girls, a Latin girl got up in the middle of the night, left the house and met her boyfriend. Now, I can't remember because it's been a while. We woke up and this girl is gone and everybody's frantic. We finally found her. It was not a problem, but the mother, oh, I know what it was. They were out at night violating curfew and so they were picked up by the cops and the mother got a call that she had to go pick up her daughter from the police station um incredible so of course the mother was very upset we were the parent as parents were very embarrassed and the next day the mother and the daughter showed up early while everybody else was all the friends were still in the house to apologize for what had happened so my students, that was, it was a very interesting experience because the Anglophones in my house learned a lot about how Latin see things and vice versa. But what I'm saying is these are the kinds of exchanges that happen in the classroom. And maybe at the end, the product, this was not done in a PBL format, but it maybe it, the product might be what kind of dating customs do you want to create for your own children? when you grow up? Do you want it to be 100% American mainstream? Do you want it to be 100% Latin? Probably not. There are probably things from both worlds. So you create your own world. Okay, do we have, I hope I answered the question. We have three minutes. Let's just do this very quickly. So remember, this is a real store from Etsy, a, a person who sells sayings in Spanish. And I remember somewhere, I remember reading somewhere that these are sayings that she remembers from her parents. Okay, so let's have a theme be sayings or proverbs from the HL. The driving question is the one that you're going to have to come up with. The driving question and the product. The product can be a store for Etsy, right? Or it can be something else around this idea of sayings and proverbs. But remember, you want to keep the focus on authenticity, right? So you don't want to do what's typically done in classes. Let's make a list of proverbs or sayings in Spanish. You want to have it be, you want to think of, so what? Why would you want to do this? What real world problem? Obviously, the store is a real world problem or driving question, creating a store of proverbs is great, right? But can you think of something else? You can have a store. I actually, um, I, I won't tell you yet. I'll, I'll let you chime in. Any ideas on uh, driving questions around the question, around the issue of sayings and proverbs?
Alejandro has an idea. Okay, Alejandro, <laughs> let's hear it. Let's hear it. No, I was just thinking of my favorite uh, words in quote unquote Spanglish, like hangar, coolissimo. So I was just thinking of like t shirts and, and cups or cards. Oh my God. Oh, no, here it is. So we have to do that, right? So we're going to do a greeting cards with um, those. Um, those ter terms that I, I I really like. I don't know. Exactly. And look at this is another store, another two stores that I found. This is a t-shirt with a, a Spanglish and it's hilarious. Uh, cuando you can't find la palabra en un idioma, so you fill it in with con la otra. So when you can't find a word in one language and you fill it out, you fill it in with the other. I know so many US Latinos that would buy this. This is great, right? And then on the right, you have a store of cutting boards with, you know, grandmothers in the Spanish speaking world are very important pretty soon, I hope. Uh, and so, um, so this is a cutting board in Spanish that says everything tastes better when grandma makes it. So these are presents, cutting boards. And actually, I noticed that you can make cutting boards with recipes. So that's another, um, to create a store of this. Yes, yes. Oh, was that a mistake? Anything else you can think of? I don't know. These are just some ideas that occurred to me, right? Dick, taking the idea of a store and kind of adapting it a little bit, not just sayings, but like Alejandro said, you can have t-shirts in, in Spanglish, right? Stickers too. Oh, I love it. Stickers <laughs> too. That's a great idea. And actually, I don't have it here, but there was, there's a store of uh, stickers too. Uh, and actually stickers for putting on containers for putting leftovers. And they're really funny and they're in Spanish uh, because I think this is, I think a lot of Spanish speakers here will agree with me. We like to put those leftovers in, you know, empty containers like um, yogurt containers and that kind of thing. And then you, you think, you see the yogurt container, you think, oh, I got a lot of yogurt. You open it up and you realize, oh, it's rice from two weeks ago. So uh, the store I found on Etsy too was about putting stickers that say exactly what's in it. <laughs> Great ideas, great ideas for a product. You can imagine students having a class competition for stores. What are you going to do in the HL? What kind of store are you going to create? So this is like that Shark Tank project, a Shark Tank. You can create a whole project around the Shark Tank ideas where they're creating a store or a product and they're competing. You can invite the parents to come in and evaluate the products. But notice in the process, they're getting a lot of language because they're not, you make sure they're not pulling it all out of here, that they're going online and looking at what's out there and seeing and, and hearing Spanish or the target language and drawing on what they're getting to create these products. You know, and it's definitely, you know, okay. just fundraising. This is Michelle, just fundraising and actually getting that product made at the end you can get them for you know eight dollars and we can actually print you know ourselves yeah. we can make the stickers we can actually do it you know and and make it happen Why not? that is a great idea that's a great idea and you're back to school night i would buy such a thing right especially if it's a fundraiser for the school why not it's fantastic right so students can compete to see which product is going to be uh, sold in the classroom during back to school night. Why not? Okay, and so to summarize, producing high quality, engaging and challenging projects in terms of themes and driving questions, think of students' everyday experiences, goals, stage of life, needs, local issues, experiences you have had, like this experience I had with a sleepover at my house might give you an idea around a project. For products, spend time analyzing in the classroom, unpacking what high quality work looks like and what bad 
products look like? And then you said to create a rubric. You're working with authentic products. That's how they're getting a lot of language, much more than they're going to get in a book, by the way. If your students are at the novice level, find challenging problems and products that can be tackled with relatively little language or where they can use other people's language. And it will still, it can still be an authentic, high quality product. And then you want to follow the stages of working with information, collecting information, processing information where they think about, wait, what's there and what do I want to pull out? And finally presenting in little bits, a little bit at a time right? Above all, have fun. I have a lot of fun with PBL because it changes every single semester. And if I make it competitive, it, it's just great to see how engaged students become. As I said, next month's workshop is a deep dive into theme, driving question and products. If you want to bring these things and, and share it with the group and, and figure out how to improve on it, great. Alejandro, I see you raised your hand. Yes. Could you please remind uh... Uh, our participants about the December 4th, the group from Hong Kong. Oh, do, Alejandro, do you want to do that? Um, sure. So we have, is it December 4th? Let me double fifth, check. Fifth, the fifth. December 5th, we is have it? another. Um, oh. December 2nd. Ooh. Ah, I'm December, December 2nd. December 2nd, okay. my apologies. Sorry about that. Yeah. So December 2nd, um, please register for this bring, um, what is post method language teaching and why has it been so influential? And it's going to be at the same time, December 2nd, 4 to 5.30 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. So professors Ana Mendoza and Jason Parba from Hong Kong and Hawaii will lead us in exploring how post method language teaching can help heritage language teachers serve the needs of their learners. So, so please, uh -huh. yeah, I'm sorry, Alejandro. No, so no, sorry. go ahead. I'm That's sorry. fine. That's no, fine. I wanted to say that Anna Mendoza puts out these great great blogs where she analyzes the literature and summarizes the research literature and summarizes it really well right, for teachers. And when I saw this blog on post-language method, um, post-method language teaching, it blew me away. And I said, that's exactly what we want for heritage language teaching. So I wrote to her, she's in Hong Kong. And I said, can you present this article? Let's have them all, we're all gonna read this article. It's very easy, very fast, because it's a comment on a research article. And then with her colleague from the University of Hawaii, they're gonna talk about, they're gonna, or they're gonna explore with us how you take this concept of post-method language teaching and use it to improve on what you're doing in the heritage language classroom. It's, it's, I'm, I'm really excited about it. So I hope go on hlexchange.com. You can see it here um, to get more information about it. Alejandro, I see you raised your hand again. Is that right? Oh, can't, can't hear you. Yeah. I just posted the URL so they can oh, register. Oh, perfect. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you very much. Also, I want to remind you that um, we have the HL Programs Fair, and um, I've, I've had some excellent conversations with people who are going to be presenting really good programs. All we're asking you to do is come and present your program. It can be a solution to some problem that you encounter, or it can be a problem that you haven't found a solution to, or it can address a specific element of your program that you think might be of interest to others. It's very informal. It's not like a formal um, conference, but we're going to give you the forum, an opportunity for presenting your program or something about a program that you think might be interesting to other people. And then talking to other people, uh, looking for common solutions, um, and also exploring common problems. So to do that, please, you just have to turn in an abstract. If you go to hlxchange.com, you can see a link to it. It's not like a regular conference abstract. It's very simple. And um, it will take place, the program fair will take place in February. And I hope you will join you. I just lined up two, well, uh, Sybil is going to give a fantastic presentation, yes, on a, a project that I love, Heritage Meets Heritage. Um, and do you want to say something about it, Sybil? 
Uh, sure. It's a project that I've, well, I didn't do last year because nobody did anything last year, um, but it's where I bring heritage students together to talk about their experience of being heritage language learners. And by heritage students, I mean from different languages. So Spanish and Korean, Greek and Turkish, that's a fun one. Um, you know, whatever, Russian and uh, Japanese. And um, it's really encouraging to see how they react to this experience. That it's so well structured the way they, they find commonalities. Right? And you're going to tell us how to structure the project so that it works oh, yeah. out that way. So it's, it's a great, great project and I highly recommend it. Maria, uh, they want to know if you're going to share the video and the PowerPoint. Um... Absolutely. So the PowerPoint is in the chat, the, the link to just the PowerPoint. The video is being recorded right now. And by tomorrow, it should be posted on our site. So when you go to our site, um, well, I, I, I I suppose I could go to it now, but I'm, I'm not very good about talking and finding stuff uh, on the site. But you can see at the bottom, it says recordings. Click on that and it will take you to a page where you can access everything that we're doing. Uh, someone else asked if there is a certification for these professional development. I will be happy to write something <laughs> that looks like a certificate. <laughs> Absolutely, because this is actually, these are the kinds of workshops that we used to give for the NHLRC, right? And if it counts there, why not have it count here? So I will be happy to produce such a thing. What do you think, Alejandro and Sybil? Sure. Absolutely. Um, so for the PowerPoint, I apologize. I have the handout, but I don't see the, oh, let me see. the PowerPoint. My apologies. No. You know, Maria, it would be really useful if along with the uh, recording, you could somehow point, uh, post the PowerPoint on the website as well. Good idea. Excellent. I will do that. Okay. So I will do that. And let me see if I can do it very quickly right now too. Oh, I see all sorts of sayings. This is wonderful. Excellent. I can tell that you are, oh my God, I'm seeing such great ideas here on the chat. Let me see if I can just find the link to the PowerPoint so you can get it right now, or you can wait until I post it, which will be tomorrow. I'm not going to do it tonight because I have a feeling I'll be a little tired. Uh, Alejandro, I see you raised your hand. No, sorry. Oh. Um, I forgot to, to lower it. Oh, so, okay. yeah. So they're looking for, they would like the PD certificate. Absolutely. And Donna has shared her email and everybody's saying, thank you. Oh, here's the power. Hello. Pardon me. <laughs> sorry. I'm going to put the, the slides right now. Um, but you're welcome. Thank you all. Um, there was something you said that wanted um, that reminded me of something else, Alejandro. What did you say? I'm sorry. Uh, the, cer the certification for the professional development. Oh, let's see. How do we do that? Maybe write. What do you think? So I think I think Maria, we should create a link or something, a special site on the web page. Uh, okay. It's not there yet, but we can do it in the next week or so, where people can apply for the certificate. Um, Excellent. That way, you know, we'll have it'll it'll be easier. Absolutely. You know, absolutely. That's a great idea. So that's what we'll do. And every time you show up for anything, uh, you'll be able to get a certificate, given the amount of time that you spend. So for this one, just email you so that you can create something for, for them? No, for, maybe not... when I post the recording, well, not right away, because it'll take a while, right? Uh -huh. We'll have to work. Oh, no, maybe when I'm post a recording, I'll also post a link to an Excel sheet where they can sign up okay. and, and give us their email address so we can send them the certificate. Perfect. And last but not least, we would love to hear from the participants and their projects. Perhaps we can interview them for a future uh, webinar. I'm so glad you thought of that. That's a great idea, Alejandro. And also, we want to feature, we want to create a database of great 
projects, right? Because that way you can disseminate all that you're doing that's working well, and in so doing contribute to everybody teaching better, right? So um, we'll keep working shy. on this. Don't be shy. No, we'll keep working <laughs> on this. Come back for the next one. And maybe we can talk about how to do this in a way we can create a database of great projects and we can feature your projects. I can see I'm looking at the chat and wow, there's some really great ideas. Any last questions? Somebody, Gloria Rivera said that she did a project on healthy lifestyle, very Ooh. LA, very California. Very, very good. important. Yes. <laughs> very important too. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much uh, for coming and um, we're going to stop recording now. Thank you, everyone.